Hi everybody, J. Patrick Lamar here, back again with chapter three of The Witches of Grey Folk. Uh, chapter two was a shorter chapter, to be sure. Chapter three is a short one as well, um, so I'm filming it just after filming chapter two, still here in the same clothes. Um, I did recap last time what had happened in chapter one, so I'll recap for you now uh, chapter one and two, just as a refresher. Now, if you haven't watched or listened to chapter one and two yet you can find those videos links are down in the description if you want to download a free digital copy of the witches of gray folk and read along uh, you're more than happy to uh, you're more than welcome to do that and i'm more than happy to share it with you um so just check the links down below you'll find a free download link down there and uh, and then the only other thing i would say is if you don't prefer to read on a digital device and you'd like a paperback copy of this particular story you can get that it's included in my tales of the evermore volume one uh, book and the link to my story will be in the description as well um so previously in chapter two azale and the captain had already escaped from the witches and found themselves just outside of gray folk um, there they met a new character dark who claims to be from another world in which every person's story has been written. He claims to know Azale's story and that Azale is bound for trouble. He says his desire is to help change Azale's um, course or to, to nudge him on his path in a different way to prevent some of what's coming for Azale. Azale proves resistant to this idea. He wants to leave and uh, go on his merry way when Dark uh, basically pleads with him to come with him to Greyfolk to help save the townspeople because the witches that they escape from in the first chapter are clearly going to come and be looking for a fight and they're going to find the poor people of Greyfolk there and uh, and they'll slaughter them if, so, if somebody's not there to stand in their way. So Dark says, listen, you come with me. I think we can stop them together. Azale says, no, I don't owe them anything. I'm going my own way. And this is where he and the captain uh, kind of part ways. The captain says, you know, they're not my people. I don't know what I can do for them, but I'm not going to leave them to be eaten or worse by these witches. So I'm going with Dark and I'll help him. Azale then threatens Dark. Hey, you better take care of him. You better make sure he has a sword, make sure he has what he needs. And Dark says not to worry about that, that he will do his best. So that's where we left them. They were separated. They were going their separate ways. Now we pick up in chapter 3, which is called Witch Slayer. Nestled between the Benjur Hills, wherein the elves hunted down the last of Caden's dark apprentices, and the mighty river Crash, which flowed some 4,000 kilometers before emptying into the Hama Basin, Greyfolk had become a frequent stop along the trade route of goods flowing downriver to coastal cities such as Stonehall and Bramblin, from mighty kingdoms like Delvingholm and the capital city of Men, then called Barahun. Though small and somewhat isolated from other towns in the region, Greyfolk had developed a reputation as a growing city of commerce, and thus had drawn to its citizenry many craftsmen and smiths who had grown tired of the competition of the larger cities threatening to drive them out of business. One such smith, a man of the West named Edwin Creel, was known far and wide for forging blades so fine they were the envy of kings. His process was steeped in secrecy, but it was said that he spent upwards of a full year forging a single sword and sold his finished works for so dear a price that only a few dozen men would ever know the glory of wielding such a weapon. He had retreated to Grey Folk not for fear of competition, but for the simplicity of life and privacy afforded him in the diminutive river town. Before laying down roots in Grey Folk, Creel had heard the rumors of disappearances and sinister secrets seeded throughout the town's history. One couldn't live there long without hearing the legend of the witches, three sisters of the gray-skinned folk for whom the town was named, cannibals, if the tales were to be believed. He had not considered that those tales could be true, until his apprentice, a young woman named Kara, had been taken in the night and never returned. Creel had ridden out with more than a dozen other men from the town and searched along the river bank. They had swept over the hills and valleys and even ventured deep into the woods against the advice of the town elders. Kara was lost, he was now convinced, never to return, and within Creel burnt a righteous need to punish those responsible. The swordsmith had chosen to forego a new apprentice for a season, and focused all of his effort and skills on forging a blade unlike any forged by men, or at least to his limited knowledge of their history, elves. The result was the pinnacle of his creative prowess, a blade stronger and sharper than any he had known, and coated 
tip to hilt in the finest silver. It was not enchanted, as elven blades sometimes were, nor was it blessed by saints or the powers of old. Still, he wagered it would hew a witch in twain with little resistance, at least it would in the hands of the right swordsman. The sun had set many hours earlier the night the wizard boy and pirate captain escaped from the witches of Greyfolk, and though unaware of the danger to come, Edwin Creel was wide awake with his thoughts fixated on revenge. So lost was he in his thoughts that he nearly didn't hear the footsteps approaching the entrance of his shop. The door was strong and bolted tight, yet creaked open slowly, as if it offered no resistance to whoever sought entrance in the dead of the night. Only a single oil lamp was lit, so Creel stepped back into the shadow and awaited whatever thief felt more bold than wise. "'You are Creel,' a voice said from outside. "'A swordsmith of fine reputation. "'Step out from the shadows, friend, for I mean you no harm.' "'Show yourself!' Creel demanded, and the stranger obliged. The traveler wore a hooded cloak, similar to the raiment of the host. "'You've suffered a loss at the hands of the Grey Folk Witches,' the man said and have since forged a weapon meant for their destruction, the blade called Witch Slayer, which seems a bit on the nose, if you'll pardon the honesty. Who are you? My name is Dark, the stranger said, and you have nothing to fear from me, Edwin Creel. I've come to avenge the fallen of Grey Folk. And what know you of my blade? Only what I've said, Dark replied. You forged it with revenge in mind, coated it in silver for its purity, and named it Witch Slayer. Meant, if I recall, to carve your revenge for Kara Dunhill into the witch sisters, should you ever manage to find them. How do you know of such things? I've not told any one of my plans, nor of the blade. I've read your story, Creel, Dark said. Particularly the events that lead me to your door. Now, seek out the wisdom in your heart. It's telling you to trust me. Say I do, Creel said. That's nothing to hinge my hope upon. Perhaps I want the satisfaction for myself. Who are you to rob me of it? You're a smith. Your part of this business is nearly done. Place the sword in the hands of one who has mastered many weapons and trust that I will see the witch is dead. And if I refuse, Creel asked. You'll soon learn of your folly, Dark said, for the sisters are coming this very night, and they will no longer be looking to sate their hunger. Tonight they will destroy every man, woman, and child in this village, to spell out a warning in your blood and drive fear deep into the hearts of the coming generations. If what you say is true, you should have sent for the beam and host instead of coming here, Creel said. I meant to hunt the devils, not protect all the gray folk from their power unleashed. The host, Dark said, are like the mountains, ancient and unmovable. Your people would be stamped out of history before their council could even summon everyone to discuss the best course of action. No help will ride forth from Mount Luminor until long after the witches have picked what is left of you and your neighbors from their teeth. These are the facts you must face, Swordsmith. Now what will you do? You could be lying, Creel said. Perhaps, but I'm not. You could be in league with the sisters. Perhaps, but I'm not. Let wisdom lead. If my words do not strike a chord of truth, deny me. Either way, your decision will be made for you. The Smith paced his floor, cursing beneath his breath. How much time? Less than you've already taken, Dark replied. Creel nodded and retrieved a rather plain wooden box. Two heavy iron hinges attached its lid, and as the smith opened it, the lamp's glimmer kissed the silver of the sword, and fireflies seemed to dance about the room. It's beautiful, Dark said, just as I remembered. Creel closed the box and reluctantly slid it toward the stranger. I'll need a scabbard, Dark said, and your finest saber for my friend outside. All right, that's it. Chapter three of The Witches of Greyfolk called Witch Slayer. I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, we will be back uh, hopefully in just a few days with chapter four to see where this thing's going next. Uh, I would love to hear from you guys as you're watching, as you're listening. Uh, Put comments and questions down below, and I'll get to as many of them as I can. Uh, As I said at the beginning of the video, if you'd like a digital copy of the complete story, you can download that. The links are in the description. If you'd like a paperback copy, Tales of the Evermore Volume 1 is the book that you want, and the link to my store is also in the description. You can find it there. Until next time, folks.